Ja, vielleicht nochmal ein bisschen nochmal. Warte, mach mal. Can you hear me? Now we try again. Can you hear me better now? Oh, I'm okay. Well, technical problems all the time. <laughs> okay, I'll start again. My name is Stefania uh, Gavazza Zuber. I'm a guide at the memorial site of Dachau, and together with Stefan Burger, who's my colleague, and he's doing the filming and my colleague Maximilian, who's supporting us from uh, um, with a, uh, at the computer, uh, would like to take you to this um, visit. The, today I'd like to talk about the International uh, Prisoners Committee, which formed uh, right at the liberation of the camp by the Americans. And it was actually already existing as a clandestine committee inside the camp. Before I start, please feel free of asking any question at any time. You can uh, type the question in the chat and um, either is Maximilian who will uh, answer directly to you or uh, Stefan will read the question loud to me. Okay, follow. let's follow me. I'd like to show you where we are. We are now on the former a pet plot, which used to be the roll call area. And uh, that day, the 29th of April, 1945, uh, there is no roll call. So the prisoners, they stayed all in their barracks. Now I like to show you where all the barracks were. They all stay in the barrack and they are quite afraid. They are afraid of being killed right before liberation. And this is um, why they're afraid, because there is a rumor circulating in the camp that um, Heinrich Himmler, who was the chief of the, uh, the commandant in chief, of the SS soldiers had given order of, give, of killing all the prisoners, not that they would fall into the hands of the Allied and they would be the proofs of all the atrocity that had been done in the camps. If you look, you can see behind me there's a long road and on the side of the roads where the trees are used to be all the barracks where the prisoners stayed there were about there were 34 barracks which they were torn down in the early 60s now what you see the two barracks that you have those are reconstruction from 1965 when the memorial site of Dachau was created but let's Let's go closer to this barrack because exactly in this barrack that's where the committee, it's about 15 people that are meeting in this, in one of the rooms inside of this barracks and they uh, want to create this uh, official um, committee and they call it International Prisoners Committee. Um, they know that they have to take responsibility over the camp. They have to avoid that there's still more killing. You have to understand that there were more than 30 different nationalities, ethnical groups in the camp and not everybody were in good relation to each other. Uh, prisoners, uh, there were so many, almost 32,000. They were dying of hunger, of sicknesses. Two thirds of them, they were on the edge of starving. So this committee, they know they have to take responsibility and they have to um, go over all the hates among themselves, among the different groups. If they have to show and uh, exemplify brotherhood, if they want to be an example for all the other prisoners. And that's what they will do. So this is uh, this reconstructed barrack. That's exactly where the barrack used to be, where they met. And they are there sitting and discussing. But the first problem that they have to if, if they really want to show that there's a real brotherhood, they have to, there's a big question. Uh, you see a young man here, 
the discussion um, uh, there's a, about democracy and brotherhood starts um, because uh, the question is, do we accept Italians and Germans members in this committee? You have to know there are also over 2,000 Italian prisoners who are in the camp, just like uh, almost over 1,000 German prisoners who had been fighting against uh, the Nazi and, um, and the fascist. But of course, they are seen from the other prisoners as uh, aggressors, as former fascists. So there is a lot of nationalism in the camp. Um, this young man is called Giovanni Melodia, was called Giovanni Melodia. And uh, the committee asked him to join the, uh, to join them, but only in a personal capacity. When, um, because he should not represent the Italians. There are some groups in the committee who don't want to have Germans and Italian, as I said. So he goes in a rampage and he says, how can it be? No, we have to give an example and we are the first one to be nationalistic. We're the first one to, uh, to say, no, this, they can be part of it and those not. Um, he said, how can it be? Germans who were here even before the, the war started, yeah, as uh, opposer to the Nazi. Um, and Italians, he, Melodia himself, he was five years in prison before then he was uh, uh, sent to Dachau by the German troops. So this, uh, this discussion explodes, let's say, in the, in the committee, then they, will, uh, they are quite impressed uh, about Melodia because he said, if I cannot represent all the Italians that I am not going to be part of this committee. They will discuss, and in the end, brotherhood wins over nationalism because he will be accepted as representative for all the Italians. And also, Oskar Müller will be accepted as a representative for all the Germans, which that was a very big step. Let me show you. Uh, this is the first uh, minutes of the meeting. If maybe you can see on top, it says the 29th of April, 45, and they write all the names of the representative. And you can see that together with the French, the English, the Soviets, the Belgium, the Dutch, the Greek, and all the other ones, you have also the Italians with Giovanni Melodia and Oscar Müller for the Germans. So they actually show a pretty much uh, good sign as an example for all the other ones. They not only decide who's going to be part of the committee, they also decide what has to be done. So if you see, I'll show you here in the bottom, it's still written in German and soon they will then translate everything in English uh, later on when the Americans arrived. You can notice that there are some points. For example, they decide that in order to administrate the camp, they need that every barrack has their own committee inside the barrack to fulfill the orders of the major international committee and to keep discipline and to keep order in the camp. They also uh, dis decide that Oskar Müller, the German who used to be the camp leader as a prisoner, he stays in this role because he's a very good person and they, uh, they know that he's is a person they can trust. Uh, and also they decide that all the jobs, that the, the work, that the prisoners were doing, like working in the kitchens, working uh, to make sure that the power plant is working, that there's electricity, uh, that the laundry um, room is functioning. They all have to, even after liberation, they have to keep working because it's sure, one thing is sure, they will not be able to go right away home. Uh, they will still have to stay for a while in the camp. So this is what they decide. Anyway, they're still all here deciding, voting. By the way, they also will vote for a uh, um, president. The president of the committee will be ch um, chose among uh, the English speakers. There were not so many in the camp. My colleague Raffaella, she did a tour, spe especially on English prisoners in the camp. Um, he was, uh, actually, he was not even English. He was uh, the real identity. He, his name was Albert Guiris. He was Belgium. But here, he arrived with a different identity because he was an agent for the SOE. 
and his name. Here was uh, Patrick O'Leary and all the prisoners knew him as Canadian, French Canadian, Patrick O'Leary. And he took the uh, leadership of this uh, committee. He spoke French, he spoke uh, fluently English. So that was ideal to, um, to communicate with the prisoners and then with the Americans when they arrived. And as a second vice president, they chose uh, Arthur Rollo, he was from Belgium, uh, he was part of the resistance in France, and there was another vice president, unfortunately I don't have a picture, his name was Nikolai Mikhailov, he was a general of the Soviet army, also with a, another identity, the SS did not know that he was a general, otherwise he would have not survived uh, the camp. So imagine, they are here, and the prisoners are very afraid. They're afraid that the Himmler is going to kill them, all, give the order of killing them all, that this order is going to be done. Now that the Americans are so close, they can hear already the machine guns and the tongues, tanks uh, shooting. Uh, they know that soon they will be liberated. At the same time, they're afraid that they might be killed right at the last at the last minute and while the committee is here they choose they used to meet in one of the far away barracks the number 24 but that day they decided to be here because they could better watch the entrance to the camp now stefan is going to show you where the entrance to the camp was uh we call it jua house and from there in fact, arrived the Americans around 5.30. All of a sudden, the committee is here discussing and voting and talking, and then they hear a very loud scream. They hear a very loud um, shout, and uh, they know the Americans have finally arrived. The joy is immense. Hundreds of prisoners come out of the barracks. Those who can run, they run. Those who cannot run anymore, they drag themselves along. There are those who embrace the soldiers and those who cry, those who cry also with happiness. So that, what you just see, it's actually an original building that was the entrance, uh, the only entrance and only way out to the camp of Dachau with the famous uh, uh writing on the on the entrance gate work set you free arbeit macht frei so that's where the prisoners see arriving the americans and those terrible 12 years they end here in dachau the 29th of april 45 but now but is the the work for the um, committee is not finished now let me show you what there is uh, still on the square. You can see that there is a big building on the form of a U. This is the maintenance building. Imagine that that's where the kitchen used to be. That's where uh, the showers, the office building it was like an office building. That's where you had the laundry room, all those uh, um, rooms that were necessary and things that were necessary to keep the camp functioning. And uh, now we're going to enter this building, which is still original, but inside we have now the museum of, uh, of Dachau. Let me open the door for you and we go inside. Okay, now we enter. So we are inside, that's where the museum starts. And I'd like to show you right away, there is a picture uh, that uh, it's a famous picture of the liberation. Then I show you a different one. These rooms we're walking through now, they were used to make prisoners working. So I just want my colleague to show you this uh, picture. Uh, it's, it's, there's a two pictures put together, but here you see what I mentioned before. The American soldiers arrive and all the prisoners, they even want to touch them. They want to touch them, they want to embrace them. They're very, very happy. And here you have another picture taken by the reporters already the first day 
of the liberation, there are reporters. Among them, there's Margaret Higgins, a very famous women reporter. She became later very even more famous uh, as a reporter in the Korea War. And you can say, you can see here, prisoners. They're so happy. They're so uh, full of joy. And behind, you can see um, the barracks where the prisoners were staying. By the way, not one of the barracks is also the 24 where the committee was meeting. Anyway, the committee knows that they have to go to the Americans. They have to show that they are uh, the, um, the one who can take over the camp and administrate the camp now that the camp is liberated and uh, waiting before they can all be sent home. Don't forget that the 29th of April, the war is not finished yet. Uh, the total capitulation of Germany will be, Nazi Germany will be the 8th of May. So there's still a lot of fighting going on. And uh, they will have right away, that means in the middle of the night, a meeting with the American uh, responsible officers. And the American, they will recognize the committee, the International Prisoners Committee, as the only legal uh, institution to administrate the camp. And they are full in agreement they, with them. They say, yes, um, you can administrate the camp. You have to take, uh, it's good that you have a police. They also had uh, created a police, prisoners police in the camp to assure uh, that there was no chaos and uh, everything, there would be discipline in the camp. Uh, you can keep your policemen. You can also look for all the perpetrators and put them in the prison. So inside the camp you are administrating, outside it's us uh, protecting you. But the Americans say since there are so many sicknesses and unfortunately there was typhoid fever, they put the whole uh, camp under quarantine. Now <laughs> you see that the camp is quite empty. Uh, is still not open to visits because of the pandemic, of COVID pandemic. So now, unfortunately, we know uh, what a quarantine can be. Uh, prisoners were also back then put under quarantine and they were not allowed to get out of the camp. <clears throat> Let me just tell you just a few words about this room. This room uh, was uh, the registration room. Prisoners, when they were sent to Dachau, they would always have to go through uh, this, um, this room to be registered. And the SS, they had special uh, documents where they wrote down all their names, where they came from, and, and they had all the list. What I'd like to show you um, is the picture that you see on that uh, panel, you see a group of uh, prisoners, and those prisoners, now Stefan is going to go closer so you can see it better, and these prisoners were Polish functionary prisoners. So already the word functionaries means that they had in the camp, even before liberation, and higher, higher position. Not all the prisoners were treated the same. Those who were um, um, in the title of functionaries, they had, of course, a better treatment. That's why they don't look so sick, they don't look so skinny like all the other pictures you know from concentration camps. Uh, they were working, most of them, in office buildings, so they didn't have very heavy jobs, uh, or they were in charge of controlling other prisoners. But this position um, uh, of a functionary uh, prisoner g gave you many possibilities. For example, they could take advantage of the position and abuse prisoners and eat more and have better clothes and uh, not caring for the other ones, or they could try risking their life to help other prisoners. And the Polish, they were the biggest group in the camp. More than 40,000 prisoners were sent to, a Polish prisoner were sent to Dachau. Among them, over 2,000 priests and about 1,000 of them died. Many, many prison, Polish prisoners did not survive the camp. Many were sent to other camps. But at the liberation, 9,000 are still here in Dachau and they are the majority. The next biggest group are the Soviets and they're just a little bit more than 4,000, so uh, not even half of the Polish. So the Polish, they had um, already 
created a clandestine um, committee and they were helping very much each other. This is also another problem that you had in, in concentration camps that usually when you had solidarity, it would be mostly of the people of your own group. So Polish helped Polish, and Soviets helped Soviets, or communists helped communist or priest, whatever. You know, is this is still a little was a problem to really open solidarity to everybody, also because they were afraid of being betrayed. There were also prisoners collaborating with the SS. So this is an important point, uh, the Polish, they want to have a role, they want to play an important role in the camp, um, and they are kind of, uh, there's like a competition who's going to have more influence between the Polish, the Soviets, and the French. There were about 4,000 French prisoners in the camp, and maybe that's the reason why um, the French Canadian was chosen as a president, because like this, nobody would be uh, upset. They had one who was neutral, and uh, and the other ones they could be happy with him. Then they. Um, what is also very interesting: one of the prisoners in the in the camp was Edmond Michelet. He was a French uh, prisoner. He was sort of the representative of the French, and he called this um, International Committee of Dachau, like the first autonomous republic of Dachau. I think it's very nice, this description, because in a way they were like a, an administration, almost like a small government uh, of, uh, of the camp. And as a government, as an administration, they wanted to have, all, they, they needed to have ministries. And one guy who was in charge of justice, imagine in the camp after all the, the prisoners suffered, they wanted to have justice. Some people wanted to have revenge and that's what the committee wanted to avoid, to add more death to the dead. So they created this um, commission of justice and the chief was Oskar Juranic and he was from Yugoslavia. Uh, he was a, the representative of the Yugoslavian prisoners and he started collecting proofs um, of uh, prisoners and SS who had done something bad against the prisoners. For instance, here you can see a document uh, where you have, uh, it's a document uh, with a denunciation of SS soldiers for the killing of the Soviet prisoners of war. That's another thing that the Nazi did um, in Dachau was also to kill prisoners of war. Uh, they did it uh, by shooting, and they collected the name of those SS soldiers. You can see the names that they wrote down who were responsible for this, uh, for this killing. They also collected names, and this is a letter from the German um, prisoners committee where they write down it's written in German, but then was, uh, I think this is written in German, or it is already in English. No, it's in English, so this is already the translation, sorry. Um, you can see, for example, there's a name, and then they write uh, why he's accused for heavily ill treatment of fellow prisoners, or, or for killing prisoners. So they write down, so these were some of the prisoners who did collaborate with the SS, or they were very, very violent towards other prisoners and they were not at all uh, solidarity. After they collected all these proofs, they would bring them uh, to the prison of the camp, which I just show you. This long building that you see here was called Bunker and the bunker was, uh, was the prison that first the SS created for the prisoners, where they killed many prisoners inside. But after the war, the prisoners' uh, committee used this to put inside, before trial, all the SS that they managed to find, and the prisoners who had collaborated with the SS. So they were, they were sitting here waiting for, for trial because this is another thing that is important. They don't want uh, 
revenge. You did this, and now you kill, and we kill you for that. Is you cannot act like the Nazi were. You have to show if you want to be a democratical country, or if you want to build up a democratical country, you need to show uh, that everybody has the right of a good treatment, even if he's uh, suspected of having done something really terrible. And then justice should, should decide. In fact, in Dachau, uh, there will be soon a special um, um, show here in Dachau about the Dachau trials. Here, I'd like to take you through the room that used to be the room of the showers. Um, another document that, unfortunately, you don't see anymore where the showers were. They were actually in front of you. On the ceiling, you had tubes and the pipes. There were pipes and then the shower heads. Everything was uh, taken away in the 50s, so we don't have it anymore. You can, we can kind of uh, recognize, though, where everything was. But let me just, one thing I'd still like to show you is this document. Um, I think it's quite interesting because here uh, you see that Polish prisoners they informed the International Prisoner Committee about the, uh, the hiding places of some SS officer because there were prisoners who were allowed to go out for, because they had to get bread somewhere or they had to go and work somewhere so they had special permission and they saw where the SS was hiding. What is interesting is that they write it and then here, written by hand, it's like the answer saying, well, yes, why don't you just describe exactly where these places are and then we'll send somebody to catch them. And here is the answer to the answer saying, no, I cannot describe it in words. I have to go there to show you. So I have to accompany, for example, the American soldiers so I can show them where it is, but I cannot explain it in words. So these are all uh, things that are going on in this ministry, if we can call it this way, of, uh, uh, of justice. Now, I like to still uh, mention the fact that is, uh, is not so easy um, for the prisoners right after, right after the war. We often think, okay, the war is finished, they all went home, but that's not how it was. It took a long time before they could go home. First of all, because many of them were so sick. Second of all, because they had the problem, uh, where do we send them back? The Americans wanted to have exact list uh, where he comes from, from which country, where should we send him, why was he in Dachau? So they asked the international committee to write lists uh, and each national committee has to write a long list of all the prisoners there are in, in their groups. So the list, uh, it will take days and days before all the lists are ready. Let me just show you. This is, for example, the list that in the end they managed to write down. And it shows you, uh, it's a list divided into nationalities and you see how many people of the different nationalities are in the camp. And if you look down in the bottom, you can see how many prisoners were on the 29th of April, 1945 in Dachau. And the list you can see it's over 31,000 prisoners. Yeah, you can read it here, 31,432 were. 32, 52, 32. Yeah, so this will uh, keep the prisoners busy for a long, long time writing down all this list. And the problem is that uh, which nationalities do you take? I mean, do you take the nationalities before the war? So it means that, for example, there were Greek prisoners or Yugoslav prisoners that all of a sudden there were Italians because that's where the Italian fascists had invaded those countries or even before they had colonies there. Or uh, what happens to the French from uh, 
um, the area, Elsass and Lothringen, yeah? Where do, you, uh, where do you send them? To France? Are they German? Are they French? friends, or um, what do you do with those Lithuanians uh, who don't want to be Soviets, or what do you do with the Jews who don't want to go back, the Lithuanian Jews or Polish Jews, they don't want to go back to this country. That was not easy, so there was a back and forth of request um, at the S, uh, um, sorry, at the SS, of course, um, the request to the Americans, what should we do? By the way, one thing I also like to mention might be a little bit funny is this one. Uh, this is a document <laughs> where, they, uh, where they are asking for uh, vocabularies. Yeah, German, English vocabularies. Uh, when the Americans arrive, they don't understand the German. They don't understand the, the French or the Russian or the Polish. They have some translators, but they, they want to have everything in English. So all the orders that have to be everything when they ask something has to be translated in many languages and especially in English. And like this, a big bureaucratic machine starts for every little thing you have to write a paper um, here. An order from the Americans is actually from the 10th of May, but it's valid uh, already in the beginning, already right when they liberated the, ca the camp, they gave the quarantine. It says nobody's allowed to go out. Um, and for this reason, only chosen prisoners, they could go out. And these chosen prisoners were mostly uh, prisoners of uh, the International Committee or those working for them. Let me show you, this was, for example, a uh, permission of going out, which was um, issued for Giovanni Melodia. I mentioned before, I showed you his picture, the Italian uh, representative. This was the document which allowed him to go out of the camp. But sometimes the guards, the American guards, did not recognize these permissions. So some problems happened, and one of the problems was, for example, that uh, those working in the bakery or those working to transport the bread, they couldn't, they couldn't go to work. So this document is a complaint that the Oscar Müller, the chief, uh, the camp leader, is writing and says, how can I assure that all the prisoners get their bread uh, if, the, if the guards don't let my people, and he writes, to go out to work in the bakery and they don't let the people transporting the bread to come here. Now imagine in the, where you have two thirds of the prisoners starving. They're very, very, um, uh, they can't wait to eat, and if they don't allow the people to go and work and bake, what are they going to eat? Here you see another quite known picture where they're distributing the bread in the uh, road between the barracks, where we were before. And you probably notice that in front there is a man with a dark coat, and he has like a band on his arm, and he was uh, a member of the camp police, the prisoners' camp police. Uh, this is uh, also... <laughs> It's another letter of complaint. Let me just show you here. There's a, uh, a little model of the camp. Since it's so big, we cannot go and see everything. But on the right, you see where the camp used to be. That is all the camp. I mean, that, that you, no, where used to be the camp. You see the camp with all the barracks. And um, that's where the prisoners had to stay in quarantine. But all this other area outside the camp that used to be the SS uh, camp, that's where then the American took over. That's where they stayed and many, they took over some of the buildings for their soldiers. They also created an hospital here to heal uh, the prisoners who were very, very sick. So they started evacuating some sick prisoners in this area. And later on, uh, they also tried to bring some of 
healthier prisoners also in this area to create more space and to disinfect all this, um, this, this place. So you can imagine that there was a lot of administration for uh, organizing who is doing which work. Yeah, it was very important who's doing which work. But like in any society at a certain point, and here maybe I can understand some prisoners who had worked so hard, so many years um, being punished by the SS all the time, now they say, we don't work anymore. We don't want to work anymore. So there are <laughs> letters, maybe it's funny, but there are, here is a document where they're complaining that some prisoners, they, uh, they even took some of the food and the objects of the camp and they managed to get out and they wanted to sell this object to the population. Or um, you have some uh, prisoners uh, who refuse to go to work in the kitchen. Here there's another complaint. It's about, uh, it's, they send it to the Polish uh, committee because some of their people, here you see their names, um, one of them was the potato peeler they refuse to go to work. You know, probably they think, why do we have to continue working? Maybe somebody else could do this job. I mean, I don't want to accuse anybody, but it's just to show you all the problems that the International Prisoners Committee had to deal with in these weeks right after liberation. Okay, let me just accompany a little bit further and I tell you a little, well, maybe a little funny story. And that's, uh, again, about uh, Melodia, this uh, Italian representative. He was one of the youngest, and he wrote in his book uh, a lot of these events. Um, and since he was in the committee and he could um, use stenography, he wrote down a lot of the discussions that were in, um, in this committee. And since he's the youngest, together with his friend, the... Uh, Norwegian uh, representative, they are sent right away, right after liberation, uh, the day after, to check why the power plant is not working. All of a sudden, there's no electricity. But since they have to go out, they have the permission. Yeah, I showed you before the permission to go out. But once they go out, they have to be disinfected. I don't have a picture how the Americans were disinfected the prisoners. I just have found this picture uh, where you, um, you see a uh, congressman. His name was Everett Dirksen, and he's being sprayed with DDT before entering uh, Dachau and then also when they had to go out. And this is actually the 12th of May. But the same thing happened to Giovanni and to Rasmus Broch, this uh, Norwegian. They go out and the Americans, they start, guards, they start pumping them. It was okay, it was fine. They had to be uh, disinfected. But at this point, some American guards, they also want to have a little bit of fun and they spray them a little bit too much. So much that, uh, let me quote Giovanni what he said. He said that after that, they looked like a flowered fish ready to be put in the pan. They were just white from head to feet. Uh, of course, the American guards, they had a laugh. My, it's, it's okay, it's fine. So they were nice and disinfected. They go out and they arrive at the power plant. When they arrive, at, which was outside the concentration camp, when they arrive there, they notice in the cellar that the boilers are not working. So they say, so why they're not working? Uh, when they go down in the cellar, they notice there are about a dozen prisoners, totally drunk. They probably found in the day of the liberation somewhere some liquors, and they were drinking, they were totally drunk and enjoying their new uh, liberty and uh, their new freedom. So uh, Rasmus, the Norwegian, says, mm, they're quite drunk. Let's know it can be a little dangerous. And Giovanni says, no, 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 I have an assignment. I have to go and, and tell them. So he always saw the good in people, and he went. He tried to explain, but, these, but they didn't have any language in common. He tried to show them that he was 
with his badge. He was uh, from the committee, and uh, these guys, totally drunk, first they want to invite them to drink, and then another one gets up and is totally upset, and they start, you know, they want to attack them, and that's when Rasmus takes uh, by the arm Giovanni and drags him out and then scolds him, look, you know, in this few seconds we risked our life, now that we're finally free. So they run to the... Um, to the um, president, to O'Leary, and then they also go to um, to uh, Olo. They denounce what, what went on. There was also the American uh, officer there, so they sent the military police there, and they will. They did try to bring to reason these rioters. But while I'm here, let me just show you this picture: the joy of the prisoners. And if you see, this is the barrack 22, and that's the barrack 24, where first this uh, committee uh, used to meet. But the picture you have right next to it, this is uh, a picture that shows what was found in the crematorium area, uh, where um, the dead were thrown in there. And that's where they found, they, 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 the American found hundreds of bodies already uh, you know, falling apart. It was days and days that uh, they, there was no burning or they didn't have enough charcoal to burn, uh, to burn sorry, all the uh, prisoners. And here, let me quote, these pictures will be taken by the Americans. Here I have a picture of uh, Margaret Higgins, who was right here on the 29th of uh, April. And I also have a picture of Lee Miller. She became also famous because she right away sent uh, a reportage with pictures uh, for the Vogue. And Dachau became known all over the world right after liberation. But I like to quote uh, something that uh, Eisenhower said, General Eisenhower, who later became the President of the United States, he said, quote, get it all on record now. Get the films, get the witnesses, because somewhere down the road of history, some bastard will get up and say that this never happened. Yeah, unfortunately, that's, he was right. You have still today people saying that this never happened, even though we have all the proofs, proofs and all the witnesses. Um, I mentioned so much complaints. I mentioned so much uh, problems. So now the, um, the committee, they also have to organize something to keep the prisoners kind of happy, kind of uh, distracted. So they will organize a feast. On the 1st of May, there will be a big feast uh, commemorating the liberation. And they also look for uh, actors among the prisoners, for musicians among the, uh, the prisoners. And they even decide to have newspapers. They want to fill also the minds, not just the, the tummy, but they also want to fill with culture and, and bring back the people to culture. They want to um, help them to get news, to do something nice, to, to sing together, to have a concert. Here I have, uh, I found one of the newspapers, most of the different nationalities, they uh, started printing their own newspaper, the Soviets, uh, the French, the Belgian, the Dutch, uh, the Greek, the Yugoslavian, they all wrote their newspaper here, for example, it's very simple, they had to type everything, but this is the Italian ones. And what did they write? They wrote what, hap what was happening outside, so they were eager to know what's going on. Is our country free? Uh, as, uh, they want to know what's going on. If finally uh, Hitler had been caught, or they, in fact, they were right that he had killed himself, they found him, uh, or they, they wanted to know what's going on outside of the camp, what's going on in their country, but through the newspaper they also inform them of the rules. One of the rules, for example, is, uh, <laughs> is the one 
that they should not do any politics. Let me just show you this here. It's, there's a little bit of light. There's more light, that's why I like to come close to the... Here is an important uh, document that was uh, given to all the prisoners and translated in all the languages. It's written by the, the prisoner, the committee representative for the Balkans. He was Albanian, his name was Ali Kuchi, and he was like the minister, uh, the responsible for uh, culture and for information. And in this document, he writes, I mean, I'm not going to read everything, but what is important, he says, we are alive. We are alive for the sake of friendship and brotherhood that existed in the camp. So there's still lots of nationalism in the camp. So they try to call for brotherhood and friendship. We share the sorrows and the suffering. There were no Polish, no Russians, no Germans, no Yugoslav, but a community of friends and brothers, a family with the same principles and ideals. And then he writes in the end, it's very interesting, tomorrow, well, tomorrow he means, we will soon return, return to our beloved ones and all our countries will be free and independent in the place. And it's only there that we will start our social activities, not here. Here we are in Dachau in the place of tortures and massacres. We should allow our representatives to fulfill their duties no chaos, no anarchy. So they say there are only two duties, friendship and brotherhood among us, and one rule, no politics. Yeah? So imagine all the different groups. You had communists, you had uh, Catholic priests, you had social democrats, you had partisans, you had so many different people fighting, of course, for the same, against the same, against the Nazi, but among themselves, they all had different ideas, and the last thing they needed in the camp was chaos because of political ideas. And here is another document where they really give all the orders, no uh, politics, no meetings poli uh, out of politics reasons, no marching for politics, just stay calm and wait until you can go home. So that was also quite, uh, quite, quite interesting. Um, another important person in the camp was František Blaha, and he was uh, the Czech representative, but he was a doctor. And uh, he was in charge of uh, um, helping all the prisoners who were very, very sick in, in the camp. Here is the picture that I'd like to show you. Um, also the Americans, they sent here many uh, nurses, many, many women nurses. So the Red Cross arrived to help. This is what you have uh, the GI's uh, hospital, but you also had an hospital here inside. And these are all prisoners who are still very sick and with, uh, with typhoid fever. And he, Frantisek, Blaha, he was uh, very, very important also because all the, the time that he was in Dachau, he had to work as a doctor and assist the SS. Then he was sent to, uh, uh, to take apart the bodies of the dead, you know, to do autopsies. And he found out many things that were going on in the camp. That's why he was also... Um, testifying in Nuremberg, and he also testified in the trials in, uh, in Dachau. Anyway, the camp is liberated. It will take about three months before everybody can go home, and you have some other problems because you have some groups that go home first, some other ones that takes a long time before they go home. So there are also a lot of anger among the prisoners, why they're going home before, why we still have to be here. French and Belgium, they go home quite fast, but of course Soviets and or Italians or Yugoslav, they are still in the camp. By the way, the last ones to leave the camp are the Italians, 
uh, Giovanni Melodia will stay till the end, uh, together with some other 12 people. And this is, I think, is very nice. I like to show you this. While he was reading one of the many communiques, uh, the many minutes uh, written, uh, by the international committee or the Italian ones or the French or whatever. Uh, one of his uh, friends, another prisoner, he did a sketch. Of, he did a little uh, sketch of him and he didn't even notice. And then after when he was ready to go home, gave him as, as a present and he kept it for a long time. So this is also important to know the role of art, of culture for uh, surviving, not just eating and clothes, and but it's also important the culture, and that's why this Ministry of Culture and Information was so important to keep the the hum to keep you know people not to desperate, but to understand. That's why also today in our pandemic is culture very very important and should not be put too much aside. I like to go outside with you and end our, our tour. I'll open the door for Stefan. We go out and I'd like to take you to the monument which was built in 1968 um, by the wish of the, uh, prison, the survivors uh, committee. And uh, there are some uh, words that are very important and they will always be important because uh, uh, we should learn from history and from the mistakes that were done in the history. Remember I mentioned that Michelet, he said that this uh, International Prisoner Committee was like an autonomous republic of Dachau. And it's interesting that in this republic you had 17 different nationalities and they all had with brotherhood, responsibility and uh, friendship, they had to take uh, this uh, duty of administrating the camp. After July 45, the International Prisoner Committee goes apart, everybody goes back home, they're all those who don't die in these three months, unfortunately many will not survive the months after liberation, but those who manage to go home, they're happy with their family, and only in the 50s, uh, some of them they will meet again, and they will create the CID, the CID, which is the um, um, the Dachau uh, Committee uh, of International Dachau Committee, sorry, the words, um, the International Dachau Committee, uh, and they had asked to create the monument in Dachau as soon as this place became a memorial site. And here I'd like to show you these uh, letters, and I want Stefan to show you these letters because they are in different languages and they say, of course, never again. And how can we assure that this never happens again? Uh, with friendship, with brotherhood, with understanding, with tolerance for other people. And here, let me just tell you what uh, happened uh, in the 50s. Six nations, they met in Rome, six nations who were before in war with each other, and they signed the Treaty of Rome, which is best known as the Economical uh, European uh, Community. Now, this became the European Union. We are 27, almost as many nationalities as we had in the camp, and we tried to create this friendship, this brotherhood, not always works out, but at least since over 70 years, we don't have any war. And I think this is very important. So this is my message to you. Uh, put aside all the nationalistic or the generalization of, of groups, uh, which is, is unfortunately going on today still. And remember, never again. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. I see there are no questions. In case there are questions, we're still a few minutes here and then we would just turn
of our uh, visit. Maybe we just take in silence a little walk and I can show you all the flower ribbons which were brought here last week. Last week we had a digital by the way, you can see it, everything online on our site, of the memorial site of Dachau. We had a digital, um, let, let's call it commemoration of the 76th uh, uh, anniversary of the liberation of Dachau. And you see the different groups and organizations and nations bringing their flowers uh, to remember everything that happened here in Dachau.